Rebounding from that positively cheery video last week, let's take a look at a current release from Shout Factory and G-Kids which may perhaps brighten our days just a little bit. Rather than looking to the past for a history lesson on morals and how to live, today we'll be looking at a whimsical tale of ghosts and adolescence. Released this month by Shout, we'll be discussing Oko's Inn, the 2018 film adaptation of a wildly popular children's book series, as well as one of the nominees earlier this year for Animated Film of the Year at the Japanese Academy Awards. This one was an unexpected surprise for us, and if you're a fan of family-friendly, feel-good, cozy anime, we think you'll find something you'll like with Oko's Inn. Oko's Inn was directed by Kitaro Kosaka, who has spent a good while in the Japanese animation industry. Most of his credits, however, have been in the animation department of other films rather than in the director's seat. To name a few, Kosaka served as key animator on Akira, Nemo, and Spirited Away while acting as animation director for From Up on Poppy Hill and a character designer on The Wind Rises. As you can see, Kosaka has some history with Studio Ghibli, which perhaps explains the childlike wonder and appeal of Oko's Inn. While on an abstract level this sentiment may be true, the visual style on display is markedly divergent from Kosaka's earlier Ghibli collaborations. In a way, the art direction and use of soft lighting and somewhat muted color palettes are more indicative of a project like Serial Experiments Lane. Admittedly, Oko's Inn doesn't get anywhere near as cerebral as Lane, but several shots are reminiscent of the earlier series. The film's screenwriter is also a Ghibli veteran, though her vast number of credits go a long way beyond the studio of Miyazaki and Takahata. Reiko Yoshida has extensive experience in the adaptation of books to screen, perhaps most notably with the script for The Cat Returns. She's also scored critical points in recent years with her work on A Silent Voice, among others. As we said though, with nearly a hundred more writing credits to her name, you've likely run into something by Yoshida in the past few decades, potentially without even realizing it. Given that it's an adaptation, however, the writing credits for Oko's Inn don't go solely to Yoshida. In fact, the film was adapted from the novel series by Hiroko Reijo. This collection of children's books were published between 2003 and 2013 and illustrated by the artist Asami. After their initial hugely popular run with a reported 3 million copies in print, Oko's Inn is still alive and kicking. In fact, today's film is not the only indicator of this. The book series itself spanned 20 volumes in total, with a manga spin-off from 2006 to present, an anime television series released in 2018, and this film around the end of the anime's run. In short, the franchise is beloved, and we believe for good reason. The story of Oko's Inn centers around Oriko, aka Oko, a young girl who loses both of her parents in a traffic accident and moves to the country to live with her grandmother. Her grandmother runs one of several inns located in her town, which encouraged tourism alongside the help of the local hot springs. The grandmother's inn is inhabited not just by humans, but is also haunted by Uribo, a ghost boy with a mysterious connection to the location and the people living there. As the film's narrative unfolds, we learn that other spirits inhabit the town, each with a unique connection to the area. Oko seems to be the only human who can interact with these spirits, meaning that the bulk of the narrative is told from her perspective. In terms of plot, that's about all we can get into without spoiling anything major. However, there are a few themes from the film that we can cover in the hopes of better understanding where Oko's Inn is coming from. If one goes in with some context, their enjoyment of the film will hopefully be amplified, so we're going to go into what we think are the major driving forces of the film, the land in which it is set, and the path on which its people travel. If anything we say interests you, be sure to check out Oko's Inn and let us know what you think below. On that note, let's get into the first part, the land of Oko's Inn. We're told fairly early on that Oko's family has a storied history within the home region of her grandmother's inn. Though Oko's grandmother now runs the establishment, we're told that this inn goes way back and has remained in the family since its inception. Oko's ancestors settled their inn at the area after seeing animals bathing in the local hot springs to heal their wounds, indicating the healing properties of the water there. This tells us that Oko's family has long maintained a supernatural connection with the world around them. Where Oko observes and interacts with ghosts, her ancestors arrived here in a time before human settlement of the area, meaning there weren't necessarily ghosts to interact with. Instead, the observation of the wildlife indicates their attunement to nature and everyone who inhabits it. 
In fact, it could be argued that the spiritual attunement extends beyond Oko's bloodline and into the culture of the town as a whole. Twice in the film, we are shown a local festival where two young people from the area offer a dance of reverence to the land. One seems to represent a human wearing traditional garb, while the other represents the nature of the area, donning a kitsune mask. This is to say nothing of how this dance and festival are explicitly stated to be Shinto, the indigenous religion of Japan, as Shinto imbues every living being, and even some inanimate objects, with spirituality, this festival teaches us that a sense of animism is alive and well within this region. In turn, this could explain how Oko's own spirituality is awakened by coming to the town. She always had the potential to see them, but never had the driving force to do so. Naturally, this means that spirits run rampant through the town. We observe along with Oko both ghosts and demons. Notably, all are portrayed as benevolent. None try to harm Oko or the other humans beyond a sense of playful mischief, disarming any negative preconceptions the audience may have about the spirits. In truth, as with the humans of the film, the spirits are just another part of the local landscape. As a side note regarding a real-world connection for Oko's Inn, Suzuki, the Oni present, is voiced by Etsuko Kozakura, who voiced Jibanyan throughout the run of Yokai Watch. We honestly don't know what this says about spirituality or animism, or anything, but just thought it was a neat connection. The Grandmother's Inn is a ryokan that is also an onsen because it has a naturally fed bathing area. A ryokan is specifically something like a bed and breakfast, and doesn't necessarily have a bathing area attached, while an onsen is specifically any natural hot spring in Japan. The two aren't always combined, though they often are, as we see in the Grandmother's Inn in this film. Onsen have been a part of Japanese history for potentially thousands of years. Dogo, an onsen still in use today and thought to be the oldest onsen in Japan, may have been in use since more than 3,000 years ago. The legend around Dogo is that a heron visited the spring daily and bathed in the waters to heal its injured leg until it was cured. We see this paralleled in Oko's inn as the ryokan where they live was constructed by their ancestors who witnessed animals bathing in the waters to treat their wounds. Historically, and even today, people visit onsen to help treat ailments. This is shown multiple times within the film, with some examples being the family who have recently lost their mother slash wife, as well as the man who was comatose for months prior to his visit. Ryokan, on the other hand, have a history of accommodating weary travelers. Beginning as Fuseya during the Nara period constructed by guilt-stricken monks over the deaths of famished travelers, Ryokan have, until modern transportation methods were developed, been places open to people in need of lodging while on the treacherous roads leading to and from the capital cities. This is again paralleled by the recently widowed man and his feverish son, as well as the fortune teller we later learn has recently broken up with a boyfriend. This also extends to Oko herself, as she is not only living here to heal her emotional wounds, she is weary from her travels. It isn't until we see her getting better that she starts to lose sight of her ethereal friends. In fact, it takes some warming up before Oko comes to enjoy her new home in her grandmother's ryokan. Oko is initially put off by her home. She's afraid of all the animals and creepy crawlies she encounters. However, as time draws on, she grows used to the presence of both the animals and the spirits, which informs us of her journey as a character. Oko begins as a clueless young woman. As she moves through her story arc and comes to understand her new environment, we see that the seasons are passing as shown with establishing shots that display different animals and plants as the year goes on. In this way, the film never beats us over the head about the progression of time. Instead, we see through these environmental changes and her choices in outerwear that she is growing as the town cycles through another year. The film's subtlety in this regard extends to character building as well, showing how Oko grows as a person mentally and spiritually. Little moments like Oko's fear of the bugs pepper the beginning of the film, with payoffs coming later on. In this particular example, we see Uribo later asking that they pray for some dead moths. Through this differing perspective, Oko learns not to be so blinded by disgust concerning the world and its creatures. In fact, this growth comes full circle when we see her confusion at a young boy attempting to harm a lizard. She was never a fan of lizards, but now she has at least learned enough to want to help the creepy crawly. We also see Oko and her grandmother going through old photo albums together. In this way, Oko learns about the world not just from Uribo and the other spirits of the area, 
but from her own family. Grandma, as shown in these photos, has clearly undergone the journey of demystifying the natural world for herself, and coming into her own maturity-wise. This further drives home for us Oko's status as a child who is just beginning to see the world. In short, the characters are allowed to breathe and have their motivations and traits explored through minor moments rather than grand statements, just like the visual progression of time. In fact, the relationships between everyone in the film are shown this way as well, between Oko and her spirit friends, Oko and the local bully Frilly Pink, Frilly Pink and the other kids at school, and Oko's family as a whole. The most standout example is perhaps the encounter between Oko and Frilly Pink upon first meeting. The other children have grown up with Frilly Pink and know better than to speak openly around her. She's vindictive and snobbish, and they know how to avoid her. Oko, meanwhile, has come from outside of this environment and has no qualms speaking her mind about Frilly Pink's less than desirable qualities. In a short scene, we are thus shown the dynamics for several key players in the film's story without forced exposition. In some cases, minor miscommunications drive the plot, lending the film a further sense of reality. Here, the biggest example is when Uribo accidentally makes Oko say she wants to take over as junior innkeeper to help her grandmother. Oko has only just started speaking with Uribo, and hasn't yet learned how to subtly commune with the spirits of the area. Thus, while she holds two conversations at once, she is making promises she never intended to. Through this, Oko helps not only the inn, but the people who come to stay there, and arguably the town as a whole, which we would say is the main point of the film. Oko's inn implores us to be ourselves and to be kind to one another, not to hold back the things we're thinking for the sake of appearing as someone we're not, and she is still learning how to live when she comes off as rude, such as with Billy Pink, but there's a certain respectability in her naivety. The film seems to say, through Oko's interactions with the humans as well as the spirits, that you never know who you'll encounter in life. Bearing this in mind, you ought to approach the world with happiness and goodwill rather than cynicism and pain. Oko has a lot to learn in her path to maturity and adulthood, but as she demonstrates several times, without necessarily intending to, adults have just as much to learn from children.